How many of you know the, the child's song, Father Abraham had many sons? I am one of them, and so are... That was bad. So are... So let's just praise the Lord. Why do we sing that song? Wasn't Abraham considered the father of the Jewish race? I am not Jewish, and most of us in this room are not Jewish by birth, so why would we sing that song? How are we really children of Abraham? This is what the Apostle Paul explains to us in Romans chapter 4. If you're new to our church, we're in the middle of a series entitled His Story. The Bible is not primarily a bunch of individual moral antidotes, antidotes like Aesop's fables. It was written over a time span of 1,500 years, written by many different human authors, but primarily it is one grand story, the story of redemption. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Michigan to celebrate my mother's birthday, and much of my extended family was present. When you gather around for family reunions of the, of the, of the like, it's not long before the stories begin to fly. My great-grandfather on my dad's side was an itinerant preacher. He preached in the United States across America on horse, and he preached in the German language with all the immigrants that were coming from Germany. My great-grandparents on my mother's side moved here from Ireland in 1912. If you know your history, that was the same year as that of the Titanic. They tried like crazy to get tickets on the Titanic, but couldn't find enough. They were on the next boat on the water when the Titanic sunk. My other grandmother on her deathbed when I was between seven and eight called me into the hospital room and said, Craig, I've been praying for you since before you were born and I pray that you would be a preacher like my, your great-grandfather was. Way back. That's some of my story. The Bible is one grand story. We said all along, if you were to put this in a play and there were four acts of the play, the story would be creation, fall, Redemption and restoration. Say that with me. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. This morning we are in the third act of this play. That is how God did intervene into history, what in fact he has done for us to get us out of the mess that we have made for ourselves. He has been telling us in the, in the book of Romans that we're justified by grace through faith alone. And not only are we saved and justified by grace through faith alone, but so were people of the Old Testament era. In chapter 4 of Romans, Paul is attempting to prove the gospel from the Old Testament. And he decides to zoom in on the history of one family, the story of one family, the family of Abraham. That's how he tells us of God's plan of redemption. People in the first century would see this idea of being saved by grace as totally foreign, a totally foreign concept to everybody. Now, if you are a convert, you might begin to, begin to see the picture as the Bible as one great story of redemption, but in the Jewish mind in those days, you would look at this idea of the gospel of grace, of radical forgiveness, the one that Jesus preached, and they would see that as entirely different than the one they'd been told from the Old Testament. It really looked to them like a different story. How many of you ever thought this in your Christian walk, I like the God of the New Testament much better than I like the God of the Old Testament. You read about the God of the Old Testament, you think this God is an angry God. He wipes out civilizations and nations. This is not the God of the New Testament. Most of us have experienced that at least early in our Christian walk. Well, say, you were, say there was television in the first century, and a Jewish reporter went up to the Apostle Paul and said, Are we all really children of Abraham? Are you really saying that? Are you saying that we Gentiles can have the same faith as you Jewish people? Do you really believe that Abraham had the same faith that we do now as Christians? You know that the Old Testament is merely about works. It's about what you have to do to earn God's favor. Nothing has changed. And Paul would have said, you're exactly right. Nothing has changed. It's all about grace. And it's always been about grace. In fact, the guy Abraham that you're claiming is on your side of the argument he, in reality, is on our side. He was saved exactly the same way you and I are saved. He received this righteousness of God as a gift from God. He had counted righteousness towards him, divine righteousness given to him. Now, that's what we looked at last week. And this morning, I just want to look at some implications of that credited righteousness that has been given to us. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, you have a righteousness that's been given to you, a divine righteousness that's been given to you from God, and this should change 
everything about your life. It should change the way you parent. It should change your marriages. It should change the way you work, your speech, your anxiety issues, your worldview, the things that you struggle with, your addictive behavior tendencies. It impacts every single area of our lives. And so this morning, I want to look at three implications of this gospel truth. You see, if the gospel is true, if it is true that we're justified by grace through faith alone, and if it's true that God has counted a divine righteousness upon us, these implications should be true of our lives. So first, I want you to note this morning, if you want to take out your sermon outline, take it out now and follow along. First note this, because of credited righteousness, we can revel in the expansion of the gospel to the nations. Revel in the expansion of the gospel to the nations. Paul is anticipating this kind of response from the people. Wait just a second. I thought the gospel was only for circumcised people. Is it for other people as well? Is it only for those who follow the law, or is it available to everyone? Now, the case should be clear-cut to us. Abraham was saved by faith apart from human works. We must be as well. But our minds have a hard time grasping this. The skeptic says there's got to be more to it than that. The Jewish person in the first century would have said, I have followed the law down to the nearest letter. Today we say, I've been a good person. I follow the golden rule. The first century person would have said, I have been circumcised, therefore God has to bless me. We say, I've done all these things. I haven't been that bad a person. God has to bless me as well. And to that argument, Paul says, you have forgotten the details of the story. We are saved by grace and by grace alone. Abraham was saved by the same grace, by that same scandalous grace. And once we realize that we're saved by grace alone, the things that happen in our lives no longer have to do us in because our identity is now in Jesus Christ. Even our failures no longer have to define us. This is the crux of Paul's argument. You can look at a lot of different quotes from about grace. And I I ran across this quote from Bono of U2. This is an amazing quote from a guy I don't believe, thinks a believer. He said, and yet, along comes this idea called grace to append all that as you reap, so will you sow stuff. Grace defies reason and logic. Love interrupts, if you like, the consequences of your actions, which in my case is very good news indeed because I've done a lot of stupid stuff. I'm holding out for grace. I'm holding out that Jesus took my sins onto the cross because I know who I am and I hope I don't have to depend on my own religiosity. No, I don't know about Bono's faith. I often think about that song he wrote, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. But i got to tell you, that is an amazing quote from someone who's looking for grace. Paul talks to us about the story of Abraham. God came to Abraham while he was still a pagan, while he was still uncircumcised, and that is when God entered into a relationship with him. That's when God placed his righteousness on Abraham before he obeyed one of God's commands. That's why we say here at Redeemer time and time again, this is what makes Christianity different than all the other religions. All other religions say you have to do certain things, follow certain rules, live your life a certain way in order to earn salvation. Christianity says this, God smiles on sinners. He sets his affections on people while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Or Romans 4, 5, a little before what we read this morning, It says, and to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Paul is saying in Romans 4 that Abraham is exhibit A of the doctrine of justification by faith. God accepts Abraham before he obeys God. That's why it says in the verse that we read this a little bit before, in verse 10 and 11 of our text, he says, how then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but it was before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. God put Abraham, uh, credited Abraham with his righteousness in Genesis chapter 15, which was 14 years before Abraham obeyed and was circumcised. 14 years before. He put his favor on Abraham even after Abraham be- commits a great big sin in the Bible and back in Genesis 12. Abraham and his wife Sarah were traveling down to Egypt. And when they got to Egypt, Abraham realized that his wife was beautiful. She was hot. And, and, he, and he knew he was going to be in trouble. And he said, I want you, when you go into Egypt, you've got to tell people you're my sister, not my, not my wife. 
He asked her to lie, and she did, and, and then I, obviously when you lie, there's a train wreck. But instead of protecting his wife, Abraham threw her under the bus to protect his own hide. After that, God imputes his righteousness onto Abraham. Don't you just love stories like that in the Bible? All the heroes of the faith, we see all their flaws, all their failures. We could talk about the scumbag Jacob. He was the father of 12 tribes of Israel, or the arrogance of Joseph, or the, even David, the man after God's own heart, who was an adulterer. He was a murderer, but he was still a man after God's own heart. Or in the New Testament, Peter, the coward who denied Jesus, and God used these people in remarkable ways. It's so encouraging because when you look at their lives, we have to surmise that there's hope for us. There really is hope. God indeed does ju justify the wicked. When he comes, to he comes to Abraham, Paul reminds us of the promise made to him in verse 17 and 18. He says, As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, he gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope he believed against hope that he should be the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. Because God has set his affections, God set his affections on Abraham the same way he does you and me, that means he can and will do it for people among all nations. And this is something we are called to celebrate and to revel in. The, same, the faith of Abraham is exactly the same the faith that we have. That means the gospel of God's free grace is for all people, for black, for white, for Indian, for Hispanic, for Asian, from, those who, from the North Pole to the South Pole to the East to the West. Do you realize how good, what good news this is? This is the reason you're a believer this morning, if you are. The gospel has spread across centuries of years, across oceans to the point where it finds us in the 21st century. Look, I'm a Gentile, and I'm pretty sure that my conversion can be traced back all the way to the Apostle Paul because he was the preacher to the Gentiles. And I've often said, as long as Jesus tarries, if Jesus waits another 2,000 years to come, that people will be coming to faith 2,000 years ago through the line of people from here at Redeemer Church. That's the greatness of the gospel. Who else could accomplish such a great feat? Only the grace of God. You know, for the last 30, 40 years, we've heard Hollywood people talk about world peace and what the world needs now is love, sweet love. Jimi Hendrix said this, when the power of love overcomes the love of power, the world will know peace. The only way the world's ever going to know peace is the gospel of Jesus Christ being spread to the nations. In fact, if you're a believer this morning, that's what we are called to do. I remember as a young kid, uh, I wasn't a Christian. I didn't become a Christian until later on in life, but I remember going to missions conferences with my family, and this one song always got my heart thinking about missions. It's from Henry Nickel. You might know this song. It's, We have a story to tell to the nations that shall turn their hearts to the right, a story of truth and mercy, a story of peace and light, a story of peace and light, for the darkness will turn to the dawning and a dawning to noonday bright, and Christ's great kingdom will come to earth, the kingdom of love and light. The motto of my seminary was to know him and to make him known, and that is what we are to celebrate and to revel in. I want to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection, and I want to make him known to the ends of the earth. That's what we are called uh, to do and to be. You know, we, uh, we're called to do that. You know, we have so many idols in our hearts that we don't even know that they're there. We have so many things in our lives that we just say, this is what I think how God wants to work in my life. But the gospel says the nation should come and teach us something about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's like when you're swimming in water, you don't even know you're wet. God's gospel is so huge, we need to revel in it. That's why I'm getting excited as we're going to look at Revelation in just a couple of weeks. And from Revelation chapter 7, we have these great verses, 9 and 10. He says this, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. If that doesn't get you excited, or as my dad used to say, if that doesn't make your socks go up and down, there's something wrong with you. Because of credited righteousness, we can revel in the expansion of the gospel to the nations. Secondly, because of credited righteousness, we can rest in the power of the gospel to transform lives. Rest in the power of the gospel to transform lives. We've been talking about the fact that Abraham believed God. 
What did Abraham actually believe about God? What was his theology? Look at verses 20 through 22. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Other translations would say that God had power to do what he promised. I spend a lot of time talking to non-believers about Christianity, and often they'll say something like this. If you've ever talked, they'll say something like this. You Christians have this pie-in-the-sky type of faith, this Pollyanna type of faith. How can you believe in something you don't see? You need to get your eyes out of the clouds, deal with reality. But our faith does deal with reality. We don't ignore reality. We don't know. We ignore the fact that there's pain and heartache in this world. But our faith rests in this. We have a powerful God, an omnipotent God, who does what he says he will do. Here is Abraham. Verse 19 tells us, against all hope, Abraham believed God. He considered his almost 100-year-old body as good as dead. He was way past childbearing age. His wife was way past childbearing age. God had yet promised Abraham offspring from Sarah that he was going to be the father of many nations. He believed in a powerful God who gives life to things that are dead. Listen to what Martin Luther said about this situation that Abraham was in. Martin Luther said this, What could be more irrational and laughable, ridiculous and impossible than God's words to Abraham? Moreover, all the articles of our Christian belief are, when considered rationally, just as impossible, mendacious and preposterous. Faith, however, is completely abreast of the situation. It, gr it grips reason by the throat and strangles the beast. It affects what the whole world and all that is in it is impotent to us. But how can faith do this? By holding on to God's word and by accounting it right and true, however stupid and impossible it may appear. By this means did Abraham imprison his reason. Faith is not irrational. It always stands on the word of God and what God teaches. That is where Abraham placed his faith. That is why he is in the great chapter on faith, Hebrews chapter 11, and this is what uh, the writer of the Hebrews says about Abraham. He says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Abraham believed in a God who gives life. Do you? I mean, this is so practical. Is your marriage broken or dead or hurting? Do you believe that God can breathe life into your marriage? Do you have an estranged relationship that's broken? Do you think, believe that God can breathe life into your relationship? Are you stuck in a pattern of sin? You either can't stop drinking or some other addictive behavior. Do you believe that God brings life to things that are dead? Do you struggle with real issues like things like anxiety that you can't seem to get rest over, but you can rest because God brings life to the things that are dead. Look at the lives of Abraham and Sarah. Faith rests in the power of God who brings dead things to life. Abraham believed in a God who creates things out of nothing. He had that childlike faith that the Bible says we're to have all the days of our lives. If you've been coming to our church, you know I keep talking about this fact that I'm a grandfather. There is a picture of my daughter, granddaughter, Lily James. Isn't she the cutest grandbaby ever? <laughs> you better not say no. When I'm, when, I, when I'm with her, I find myself doing some of the things I did, and my kids will tell you this, that I did when they were kids, some of the same things, like talking Goo Goo Gaga talk and all that kind of stuff. But last time she was here, I sang this song. Do you remember this song? My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are his, the rivers are his, his skies are his handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. You believe that? Children believe it. 
Why do we adults forget those simple, simple truths? We do it all the time. There's an iconic picture of John F. Kennedy in the Oval Office. If you're old like me, you'll remember this picture. He is the most powerful man in the free world as president. Just below him is John Jr. playing with his toys. And if you were to ask John Jr. at that that point in his life, do you realize you're sitting underneath the most powerful man in the free world, the president of the United States? He would have said this, yeah, that man is powerful. That man is mighty, not because he's president, but because he's my daddy. We have a heavenly daddy that's all-powerful, and we are called to rest in him, to trust in him, because he can do all things. He can change your life. He can change your life even this morning. Because of credited righteousness, we can revel in the expansion of the gospel to nations. We can rest in the power of the gospel, for it will transform lives. And thirdly, because of credited righteousness, we can receive the person of the gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ. What is Paul's thesis in Romans 4? That Abraham's faith is exactly the same faith that we who believe in Jesus have today. Do you know what happened to Abraham? He was promised his child, Genesis chapter 1. God gives him Isaac through Sarah. Then Genesis 22 happens. Remember the story of Genesis 22? God asked Abraham several years later to sacrifice his only son Isaac on the altar. He asked him to walk up Mount Moriah to take Isaac and to sacrifice him, this lamb, this lamb uh, sacrifice his son as a lamb offering to God. As they're walking up, Isaac asks his dad, Dad, where's the lamb we're supposed to sacrifice? And Abraham's Answer, can you imagine him saying this? God's going to provide the lamb. You know the story. Abraham binds Isaac, has his knife right over his head to kill him until he hears the voice of God saying, stop! There's a, in the thicket over there, there's a lamb that's stuck. That's what I want you to sacrifice. Abraham had to be shaken to the core. Abraham had to be wondering, what in the world is God wanting me to do this for? It's a picture of faith that sometimes is weak, and messy and hard. Life is like that. Francis Schaeffer said this, to be a Christian is to walk with a victorious limp. And it's so true. Because we live in a fallen and broken world. Cultures rise, cultures fall, economies do well and they crash at times. We're healthy at times, we're sick at times. Only one team wins the Super Bowl, all the other teams are let down. This is the reality of the world that we live in. And the day is going to come as long as Jesus tarries that all of us in this room are going to die. So where's our hope? Paul says, our hope is in the same Jesus that Abraham looked forward to, that we look back to. You say, Pastor Craig, how can you say that? Abraham didn't even know about Jesus. He didn't know about Christ. They didn't know about the cross. He didn't know about the empty, empty tomb. He didn't know about Pentecost. How is there really one big story in the Bible? God made a promise to Abraham. He believed God, and it came to pass. He told Abraham he would be the father of many nations. And Abraham had this belief that a Messiah was going to come, that a lamb was going to become, that the lamb that was in the thicket on Mount Moriah pointed to. People often say or think, you know, if I had lived in those Old Testament days when God spoke to me through a burning bush or spoke to me audibly or or visibly, I would believe him every single day of my life. That's not true. But take a look at other people in this room. Look around. You are visible uh, signs that represents the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. Every one of us in this room is trusted in Jesus Christ alone for his salvation, or one more star in the sky, or one more granule of sand on the seashore. Did you hear what, they, what uh, uh, was read from Romans 4, 23 to 25? But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Jesus Christ came not only to save the Jewish race, but to the, he saved people from all nations. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, there are sheep from another pen that I must go and save as well. Abraham was a sinner saved by grace. All of us are sinners. The Bible said all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There was no one righteous, and the only one that ever lived a perfect life was Jesus because he was God in the flesh. And that's, the, that's his story. Only the gospel, trusting in Jesus Christ, breaks down cultural barriers and brings blessing to the nations. 
Only the gospel says your heart can be free from the sin that reigns in your life. That's where the victory is found. That's what we learned in Vacation Bible School this week. Abraham believed in the power of God to bring the dead back to life. When he walked his son Isaac in Genesis chapter 22 up that hill, he thought he was going to have to kill his son. But he believed in the power of God to raise him back to life. There's another time when a dad asked his son to go up the hill to to the cross to be sacrificed, and no lamb in the thick was found for him, and his name was Jesus Christ. Jesus died not because he had to. He was sinless. The grave could not hold him. That's why we believe that he was resurrected. Now, I know there are people in this room that have never trusted in Jesus alone for your salvation. Don't you want the faith that Abraham had? Does your soul long to rest? Are you tired of running from God or trying to earn God's favor with your life? Can you bring yourself this morning to admit that you're a sinner and that you need a Savior? What is to keep you from trusting in Christ right now? Those of you who professed faith in Jesus Christ, can you say this morning you have that childlike faith that your God is so big, so strong, and so mighty there's nothing your God cannot do? Or does the life you live betray that? Most of us often live like practical atheists. You can believe intellectually today, but your life betrays the way what you say you believe. Can you say this morning, God, I believe, but help my unbelief? Give me the faith of Abraham. God, you are my one defense, my righteousness, how I need you. As Abraham considered his body as good as dead, we on our own are dead to our spiritual things as well. So we commit ourselves to Christ as his word tells us, and we find the power of God who breathe life into us today, this day, uh, and forever. Father Abraham did have many sons and daughters. And if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ today, you're one of them. That's why we leave this place praising the Lord. That's why we leave this place part of his story. That's why we leave this place with a story to tell to the nations that transforms cultures, transforms countries, transforms families and individuals. Is it transforming yours? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for the fact that, Jesus, you are king, and you do reign, and you reign forever and ever. And I thank you for that simple promise that you are so big. There is nothing you can't do. You can have a baby born from a lady that's 100 years old. You are that mighty and that powerful. Father, many of us in this room believe, but I ask that you would help our unbelief. Many of us trust in you but we give in so quickly to the ways of this world, our faith wavers. And Father, would you take the little faith that we have and multiply it? Father, for those of us who do not know you this morning, may they come to the place even today where they trust in you alone for their salvation. And we will give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we close.
a Savior friend, and I know that Thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I this morning. Stay for the fellowship time. We have a Sunday school hour that follows. If you'd like some more information about our church, you can see me afterwards as well. Now receive the benediction and blessing from God. And now may the love of God and the grace of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day, this week, and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.